Hello, Una family, and here we are again. I am so sorry that we are not meeting today in person. I really had planned on it. Hadn't occurred to me that the parking lot hadn't been cleaned off. I don't know if we could have gotten anybody or to do it or not, but it was a mess. It was so bad that Mark got stuck in it this afternoon, Saturday afternoon. It took him about a half an hour to get out. Good news is he got out. But uh, he called me right after that and said, I'm not so sure that we should do this. And so we changed our minds and uh, thought it would be safer for us to meet this way, get back together next week. We should be able to do that. And uh, the weather should be much better. Hopefully this is the end of our meetings this way. I'm so glad that we can. But uh, to be honest, I miss you guys. I miss singing with Derek and the worship team. I, I miss being a part and singing with you. I, I am looking forward to getting back. And uh, my goodness, <clears throat> let's all get healthy. Let's get those shots and let's get healthy. Some of you have gotten that. I'm so glad for you. I haven't got mine yet. Not, a, not, not the age group yet. You know, when you're 30-something, it's, it's just not time yet. You understand that. But anyway, that being aside, glad to be able to share with you today. Now, what I wanted to do, I was really looking forward to sharing with this in person, but Saturday night, I wanted to do this tonight uh, so I could get this up on the, on the web for tomorrow. Uh, you would hopefully be able to see this in an early morning rather than a Sunday afternoon. And what I want to do today it's kind of put a bow on the book of Acts. We're going to finish it off. Now, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we finished the book of Acts. But we're not finished with what happened to Paul. Paul, when we left him, was in some dark days. There were difficult times. Paul was accustomed to those things. It made me think about our own times. Um, now, and some of you even much more than just all the COVID uncertainties and so forth, you've got some real problems, health problems, family problems, um, financial problems. We all experience dark days from time to time, don't we? We all do. And Paul certainly had that. And, and so I, I want us to take a look <clears throat> at Paul's life at the end now and how he survived that. When we get to the end of Acts, Acts chapter 8, last verse, it says that the gospel went on unhindered. We don't have a biblical record of this, and I, I want to make that very clear. We don't have a biblical record of this, but we have a fairly well-established historical tradition and probably accurate uh, as to what happened to Paul in general, in a general sense. So probably what happened, you recall Paul was arrested, taken to, to Rome. Um, he had spent two, two years in a house arrest. And then in 60, we, we presume in 62 AD, started in 60 AD, in approximately 62 AD, he was let go. Why was he let go? Well, probably because no one from Jerusalem came to bring any charges against him. Remember, at the time he was there, no one said anything about it. No one knew anything about it there in Rome. So it's very likely that the Jews from Israel thought, we're not making that long trip, so just forget it. And so he stayed there a length of time and was freed in approximately 62 AD. Probably, tradition says that Paul was able to leave, may have gone to another place, may have even gone to Ephesus, but he ultimately makes his way to where he wanted to go, which was Spain. Remember in Romans, he talks about 
His desire is to go to Spain. Why Spain? Because that's the furthest, it's getting further and further away from civilization. And he wants the gospel to go into the entire world. And so we believe that he went to Spain. And while he was in Spain, it's possible, some think, he may have even gone on to Britain. Can you imagine? It's a long ways away. And yet it's very possible that Paul did that. He comes back in 64 AD. Now, 64 AD is a big year. You would know it. It was the year that Rome burned. You remember the story? Nero was the emperor. Rome burns. Much of the city burns down. And the old saying, Nero fiddled while, while Rome burned. Not really accurate. Nero didn't play a fiddle. There was nothing like that around there, but he certainly didn't want the blame for it. And as a result, Nero blames the Christians, right? You know that, don't you? Nero blames the Christians. 64 AD is the mo most likely year that Paul returns from his extensive mission trips to Spain and maybe other parts of the world. When he comes back, he probably comes back to Troas. We'll find out why that is in a moment. Comes back to Troas and was because they already knew, right? They knew because he had come up for trial before. They realized that Paul was a big dude in the Christian realm, right? He was one of the big leaders. And so likely what happens in 64 AD, Rome burns, Paul returns, they know where Paul is, they arrest Paul in Troas and quickly take him to Rome. But this time, he is not in a house arrest situation. In fact, he's in a, a dungeon, a dark, dank dungeon, a place that he's not going to get out of this time. These are the dark hours of Paul. What does Paul do in the dark hours? Well, in typical Pauline precision, he writes a letter. Who does he write it to? He writes it to Timothy. We know it as 2 Timothy. It's a letter to Timothy. Why Timothy? Well, Timothy was kind of a, uh, a son in the faith. And he wanted to, to give him almost his last will and testament, the last opportunity to encourage him to carry on in the faith. And when he comes to the end of his letter, which is what we're going to look at, and by the way, if you've got a Bible, please get it, because I won't be able to share the scripture on screen. So get a Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 6. So please get that. 2 Timothy 4, 6. He writes to Timothy, and in the end of his letter, we, be, we see the heart of Paul. Uh, he really puts his life on display for all of us. It's a, it's a blessing that we're able to see this, really is. And uh, that's what we're going to look at. Because when I look at these verses, 6 through 18, I believe, we're going to see some of the things. In fact, we're going to find three of them. There's more than that, but I'm going to point out three of the strengths that Paul held on to in his darkest hours. How does he get through it? How does he, how does he manage this? How do you manage it? It's not just, I'm going to tough this thing out. It's not, things are going to get better. It'll all work out. Don't worry about it. He's very honest about what's going to happen, as we will see soon see. But he's got some power reserves, I guess if you'd say, some coping mechanisms that are not just coping mechanisms. They are things that will see him through his darkest hours, and this is why I'm excited about it, it will see you through in your darkest hours as well. So what are they? I'm glad you asked. First one. First one is 
You ready? You want to write this down? The promise of heaven. First thing that's going to give him strength in his dark hour is going to shed light in a dark time is that there is a promise of heaven. You ready? We're going to take this verse by verse. It's that good. Let's take a look at verse 6. For I am, this is Paul speaking, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time for my departure is close. I'm poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is close. Now remember, we're talking about the promise of heaven, all right? Paul is dealing with reality. He knows where he is and what is going to happen. But the reality is going to be mitigated, if you will, with the promise of heaven. Now, how does he say that? How does he describe that? Well, let's look at it. He says, I'm, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I did a little studying on that this week. Found out some, a couple of interesting things. Um, a drink offering was something that was done as the last thing after the sacrifice was done on the altar. When, when, the, when the blood had been spilled and the animal had been sacrificed, the last thing that the priest did is he took a jug of wine and he poured it out. It was last things before the final thing, which was the, the presence of God. But I also found something else interesting about the drink offering. When you go back and you look at it in the Old Testament, the instructions that are given to Moses, I think they're in Leviticus and Numbers, they talk about the drink offering not being done, not being accomplished for the first time until they get to the promised land. What's significant about that? What's significant about that is the promised land was the, was the land of rest. It was the land of Sabbath. It was the promise of God. It was the place where the people of Israel were going to find their place. And I think Paul is making that kind of connection. He's saying there is a land of promise, a promise of heaven, that this old body is being poured out in a final act before I enter into the promised land, or as I enter into the promised land. But also, he says something else. He says, the time for my departure is close. The word departure, interesting word, great word. Again, love looking this up for you. Has several different meanings. One is taking the yoke off the oxen after a long day's work. It also means loosening the tent pegs of the tent to leave. And then one other thing, it is loosening the ropes that hold the boat docked or moored to the dock. Think about that. When Paul writes this, he says, my departure. He's not just He's not being a fatalist. He said, I'm, it's the end, guys. It's all done. Just forget it. It's the way it is. End of my life. No, he's not. He's making a strong statement about the promise of heaven. He is saying that I am tired. I've been ministering in the field of God for years. And it is time that God takes the yoke off. You know what Jesus said? Take my yoke upon you. And I think what Paul is saying, I'm getting the yoke of ministry and all of these things that I've had to do in my life. I'm tired. I'm finished. And now I am free. But also he's saying, this old body, this tent is ready to move on. My pegs are getting loose, <laughs> and I'm ready to go on. But I like one other thing. That boat being moored to the dock, when you loosen those ropes, the adventure 
truly begins. Paul is saying, look, the departure is, is near. He is not saying that in a resigned way. He's saying that in a glorious way, the promise of heaven is going to get me through these dark days. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. This is a very well-known verse, isn't it? I want you to notice a few things about it. First, it's, he kind of gives himself the picture of being a soldier. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race, an athlete. And also, I've kept the faith, a guardian. It's all three of these things that he's, he's been all of his life. Then I want you to notice something else. He says, I didn't, he didn't say, I have fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. If he were saying that, he'd be bragging. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I fought, I fought the good fight. What is the good fight? It is the fight that God laid out for him. It is God's fight that he has invited him to be a part of. And he said, that is what I've wanted to do. I wanted to fight the fight that God has given to me all the way. And I finished the race. And all through it, I've kept the faith. I remember those times that I ran many marathons, 13 miles. Started off great, man. It was all kinds of trumpets and bands and sounds and excitement. And you get going. It's great. People are cheering. It's wonderful. Go along three or four miles. You're doing okay. Five, six miles. Yeah, you're getting a little tired, but you're, you're okay. For me, it was always mile number nine. That's when I said, it's hot out here. It's tiring. Who cares if I finish? And about that time, you'd hear somebody, maybe that you're running with, or someone alongside, you're doing great. You're doing, don't quit now. And it'll just get you going. And that's what Paul, I finished the race. You know why? Because I've kept the faith all the way. I've kept the faith all the way. I, I love the fact when he says I fought the good fight, the word in Greek, we get the word agony. It's the agonia. Straight out of it. We talk about agony. It is a it is a one-to-one -one combat. Paul in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, you don't need to turn to it, but let me just read this talks about his <clears throat> agonia. And he writes, he says, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, Dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things, there is this daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. We know Paul's life was an agonia. Your life is filled at times with agonia, is it not? These are the dark hours when the agony comes upon us and we are struggling with life and struggling. Can we finish the race? And are we going to keep the faith? And Paul knew that. Paul knew that. But I think, not I think, but I know that the promise of heaven kept him going. Look at verse 8. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. Mm. See, I, he had the promise of heaven right there. I mean, it was in his dark days, he had the promise of heaven. What we struggle with many times is, I like what Paul David Tripp and... and uh, the New Morning Mercies devotional I read every morning said just a few weeks ago that we struggle with eternity amnesia. Let me read what he says, has to say. 
There has to be more to God's plan than this world of sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. Wouldn't you agree? There has to be more than the temporary pleasures of this physical world. Yes, there is more. And when you live like there is more to come, I get this, you live in a radically different way. When you forget eternity, you tend to lose sight of what's important. And when you lose sight of what's important, you live for what is temporary. And your heart seeks for satisfaction where it cannot be found. Looking for satisfaction where it cannot be found leaves you spiritually empty and potentially hopeless. Meanwhile, you're dealing with all the difficulties of this fallen world with little hope that the, the things that now will be the paradise, it will never be. Let's, I missed that. That things will be ever be different. Living as an eternity amnesiac doesn't work. It leaves you either hoping that now will be the paradise, it will never be, or hopeless that what is broken will ever be fixed. So it is important to fix your eyes on what God has promised will come true. Let the values of eternity be the values that shape your life today and keep telling yourself that the difficulties of today will someday completely pass away. And that's what Paul was saying, the promise of heaven. One day I'm going to break through. I'll finish the race and I will get the laurel leaves of being in heaven. Righteous. Whose hands will put them? The crucified hands of Jesus Christ. In the dark hours, the promise of heaven kept Paul going. But that wasn't the only thing. Let me give you another thing, all right? You got the promise of heaven to people of comfort. Promise of heaven and people of comfort. Verse 9, make every effort to come to me soon. Again, he's, he's writing to Timothy, but I, like, I want you to hear the urgency in his voice. Please, come as quickly as you can. We would say, come ASAP. <clears throat> Why? Why would he do that? Well, time and again, we've already seen how Paul in Romans and all the in other letters, when you get to the end of it, he points out all the people who made a difference and, and need to be greeted and welcomed. And Paul was a man who knew that he needed others. It runs against our American nature that we're independent. I know I struggle with this. We're independent. We can handle it. I got it all together. Don't, don't worry about me, blah, blah, blah. And that's not Paul. Paul's saying, Timothy, I want you to get here as quickly as you can. ASAP, man. Why? Well, verse 10 tells us, why? Because Demas has, has des deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus, Dalmatia. The last two were workers that were sent off to various places, but the one who has really broken his heart was Demas. We don't know a lot about Demas. He's mentioned in a couple of other letters. He was part of the working ministry of Paul, one of the associate missionaries along the way. And I don't know if what happened when Paul gets back from Spain and he's arrested, that he says, I've had it, that's it, no more, I'm done. And he heads out to Thessalonica, which was a big city, and he loses himself. In fact, the word when he says he's deserted me is exactly what it means. He has left me alone. Talk about dark hours. When everything's going bad and then people that you're counting on leave you. You know that feeling, don't you? When people talk about you and talk behind you and, and, and do things to harm you and break your heart. And Paul says, Timothy, I need you here, man. I need a friend right now. He goes on. In verse 11, he says, only Luke is with me. He says something very interesting here now. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. 
says, Luke is with me. That's it. Dr. Luke, thank goodness for Dr. Luke. Well, would you bring Mark? Now, remember Mark? Now, if you remember months ago when we were talking in, in Acts, when Paul was had gone through his first mission trip with pa Paul and Barnabas, and Mark, in that first mission trip, splits. We don't know why, but he did. He left. And now they're ready to go on their second mission trip, and, and Barnabas, who is, I want to say the cousin, I believe it's the cousin of of Mark, he says, we need to take Mark with us. Give him another chance. And Paul says, there is no way. Not going to do it. Forget it. Not going to happen. Such a such a argument uh, comes about that Paul and Barnabas split. And now it's Paul and Silas. Now at the end of Paul's life, we don't know what's taken place, but something's taken place. And Mark has shown himself to be worthy. Someone who's of value, someone that you can count on. And the result is, Paul, he doesn't hold a grudge, but rather he says, you bring Mark with you because he is important. He's useful to me in the ministry. You tell him to come here. And then he goes on. He said, I've sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you, came, when you come, bring the cloak I left in Troas with Carpus, as well as the scrolls, especially the, car, uh, the parchments. And I think he says, um, I want you to uh, get my cloak. And, and this is why I say that possibly Paul was in Troas, because it's, it makes sense. We don't know this. But he left his coat. Now, that coat was like a blanket. It was a very important thing. And if he was arrested quickly and he couldn't even gather his things, might have left it there in Troas. That's why I say that. Maybe he was in Troas. He says, also bring the scrolls and parchments. I want to read. I want to read the Old Testament. That's what he's talking about. I want to read the Bible. Do you read the Bible in your dark hours? Do you use scripture? Bring the Bible. Bring, bring my parchments. Probably like the New Testament. Yes, the beginnings of the writings that he had collected. As He said, I want, I want you to bring them. Then he, he finishes this section by saying, Alexander, the coppersmith, did great harm to me. The Lord will repay him according to his works and watch out for him yourself because he strongly opposed our words. And he says this, we don't know who he is, Alexander, the coppersmith, some kind of craftsman, didn't like Paul, probably cut into his business with idols. We don't know that. But he says, man, he tried to do me harm. Do what you can to pay him back. No, 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 he didn't say that. He says the Lord will repay him. In your dark hours, it's easy for you to become bitter and angry and vengeful. But he says, I'm going to leave this to God. But now you watch your back, okay? Be mindful of him, but don't harm him. You know, the promise of heaven is critical. It's something that we need to have, but it doesn't eliminate the need for the people of comfort. Those friends around, they call and make you laugh. They give you a word of warning and encouragement. Your spouse, if you're blessed. I heard this the other day. I thought it was fascinating. I never thought of this before. That the most humble thing that God did at creation. What was the most humble thing that God did at creation? It was this. God created man with the need for others. Think about it. God could have created man so that his needs were exclusively and only him. But instead, you remember what God said about Adam? It is not good for man to live alone. Not good for man to live alone. And I think what he's saying is that I've also created a need in your life Certainly for me first, but the need of others. There is a need for the people of comfort. It's very possible in your dark hours, one of your weaknesses is you're trying to go it alone. You're trying to do it by yourself. I know because I've done it and I will probably do it again until someone gets a hold of me and said, 
You can't do it that way. It doesn't work that way. You need people of comfort. All right, let's move on to the last thing. Promise of heaven. People of comfort. And the, the third thing that kept him going in the dark days was, this is the most important, the presence of the Father. The presence of the Father. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. There will be those times. Remember that old song, you got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You got to do it by yourself. And there is the truth to that. <clears throat> there is a truth to that. That your desire for people to be there is impossible for them to be a part of your life at that point. You may be deserted by those that you love. And those that you <clears throat> desire to be there cannot be there, but you're not alone. Now, I want you to know what he's talking about. He says, in my first appearance, my first defense, apparently in Roman law, there were two appearances before the judge or, or before the emperor, if you went up that far. The first one was kind of an arraignment. They tried to figure out if you were guilty, you know, if the charges were sincere and accurate and worthy of being tried for. That was your first one. He says, that first time, I had nobody with me. The second one was to determine your innocence or guilt. But I want you to notice one interesting thing about there. It says, no one was at my defense. Everyone deserted me. But then he says, may it not be counted against them. You know what that sounds like? As soon as I read that, it said, you know who that is? <clears throat> Well, it's Jesus, but I want to give you one other. It's Stephen. Remember when Stephen was being stoned? And he said, may it not be held against them, may it not be laid at their charge. Guess who was there with Stephen, giving his consent to his death? That's right. It was old Saul, who later on became Paul. And to me, when Paul says this at the end of his life, it comes full circle to the beginning of his spiritual life, when he saw and heard Stephen, the martyr, dying and is with his last breath, let it not be laid at their, at their charge. May it not be counted against them. Wow. Did Paul learn something? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might... Fully preached the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. It said, when, when I was up there the first time and charges would be laid against me and I had no lawyer, I had no friends, I was all by myself, God was with me. So he could have been angry. He could have been bitter, resentful. No, he said the Lord was with me. And why was he there? He was there to strengthen me and embolden me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's what I'm here for. I've got a purpose. And he led me out from the lion's mouth. Now, folks, it's not talking about Nero and, and the Christians being fed to the lions because that wasn't even happening yet. The Colosseum was built another three or four years from then. I think what he's talking about is the lion's mouth is Satan who wanted to devour him. And he said, he, he kept me from that. And God saved me from that. Now look at verse 18. Reality here. Reality check. It's going to get better. I mean, he's going to get, everything's going to try. No, no, no. Reality check. Verse 18. In the dark days, the Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What is he saying? He's saying, in these dark days, while I'm in the hands of Nero, and he's looking for somebody to blame, and I'm a leader of these Christians. I'm going to put out a great defense, and I'm going to win the day. No, that's not what he says. He says, reality is, this doesn't look good at all. And he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil work 
All right, Paul, he's going to get you out of this, right? You can't stop there. And bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Get this, get this good now. In your dark hours, right? You want to get out of this thing. I want you to understand, in your dark hours, God will either save you from the dark hours or he will save you through the dark hours. He'll either save Paul from death or he'll save him or from death or through death. He says, my greatest hope is not to get out of this trial alive. My greatest hope is to finish the race, cross the line, see my Savior. That's my hope. And if it means death, then death, I have, you have nothing to make me afraid. I'm sorry. You are simply going to give me what my greatest hope and dream is, to be in the presence of Jesus Christ, to be with the Father. Remember that eternity amnesia I was talking about? Paul didn't know anything about that. He knew that a lifetime of dark days was going to turn into an eternal, glorious day. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says it this way, But as it is written, I has not heard, seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Are you struggling? Dark days. Hey, let me, let me, uh, and I hope this will work. I hope it'll work as I work on it a little bit. I want to put in a, a video. Well, it's one of my favorites, and I, I've showed it at church. It's been years. It's from 1992 in the Olympics. Because there are those times that we run the race, and we're just about to finish the finish line, and then it happens. And we're not going to finish it. And what are we going to do? Those dark hours of the dark days descend upon us. Well, I want you to look at this video. And I think it, it will encourage you today. All right? I'll be back after it's done. <laughs>
Is that not an awesome video? I've watched that multiple times, and multiple times I have choked up. You feel like Derek Redman. You're running the race. It's going good. Everything's going like you thought it would go. And then it happens. And all of a sudden you are flat on the ground. You get up. Because the race is important. But then the Father comes. Ah, so good, man. The Father comes, and you put his arms, your arms around him. He puts his arms around you, and he carries you home. The promise of heaven. The people of comfort. And the presence of the Father will get you through the dark days. It did Paul. And one day, we're going to sit around the table. And listen to Paul talk about the faithfulness of Jesus. Hey, thanks for uh, sharing this morning with us. We'll be back in the sanctuary next week, God willing. Okay, we'll see you then.